Hey everybody, it's Emily. Welcome to another Grass River Micro Class. So today I wanted to talk about late summer wetland wildflowers um, because there are still a lot of colorful blooms out here in the wetlands. Um, and not only are these flowers beautiful to look at, but they're also really important for pollinators in our area. Um, both for pollinators that migrate, like hummingbirds and monarch butterflies, so they can fuel up before their big long journeys, but also for pollinators that overwinter here so they can build up their reserves, um, whether they go dormant, um, like bumblebees do, queen bumblebees in the um, winter, or whether they are active but overwintering in um, a sheltered area like honeybees in their hive. So let's go take a look at some of these important blooms and we'll learn how to identify them. All right, so here we have an aster. Um, and I'll just start by saying that asters are super hard to tell apart. Um, there are tons of different kinds that live here and the differences between them can be pretty minute. Um, like the number of um, rays on the petals or on the flowers, so the number of petals. Um, or some things like um, are the leaves like really sharply tipped or are they kind of blunt. Um, but this I believe to be a uh, purple stemmed aster, also called swamp aster. You can see that the stem is a little bit reddish. Um, and this is one of my favorite asters because of the color of the flowers. They can vary from a really light lavender to like more of like a deep periwinkle like we're seeing here, um, just beautiful. The centers are always yellow, um, but with age they can turn, they turn reddish brown like this one right here. Um, and this um, aster is really similar to New England aster, um, but New England aster tends to have a little bit blunter tips on the leaves and also it tends to be even brighter um, in color than this, sometimes slightly more pink. Um, and it has a few, it can have a few more um, petals around the center of the flower. Like this, um, this one, purple stemmed aster, tends to have like 30 to 60 rays. Um, and New England aster will have 40 to 100. Here's an example of another purple stemmed aster where you can really see that purpley reddish stem well. This beauty is called turtle head and it, I think it really does look like a turtle's head. Um, it's got these two lobes kind of and the like mouth opens right here. Um, and this flower blooms from the bottom of the spike up so it's still got a few blooms to go. It's got these really long thin leaves um, that are opposite on the stem. And uh, this flower is pollinated pretty much exclusively by long-tongued bumblebees um, because the bumblebees um, are one of the few insects that have the strength to pry open these lips and get in there. But then there's this false stamen. I'm not sure if you could see that in there. Um, a false stamen that kind of blocks the forward progress. And so the bumblebees have to have a long tongue in order to get the nectar, which is way back here at the base. Um, and occasionally you'll see chew holes um, at the base of the flower where um, a bumblebee has been kind of impatient and chewed a hole um, in there as opposed to gone in through the front. And um, one other neat thing about this plant is that it is the sole host plant for, or one of the host plants, but the main host plant for um, the caterpillars of the increasingly rare um, Baltimore checker spot butterfly. All right, team. This, just like the asters, is one of those groups of plants that is really difficult to um, tell apart the species. This is a goldenrod. We have um, up to, we have more than 20 species of goldenrod in the state. Almost all of them are in the genus Solidago, but not, um, but not all. Um, and this plant, I should say lots of them grow in wetlands, lots of the different species, but some of the species grow in other habitats too, like drier sites like fields or roadsides, so it can get, can present kind of weedy like that. Um, and let's see, 
Uh, one thing though that I do want to stress about goldenrod is it often gets blamed for um, the hay fever that many people experience this time of year. Um, the allergies where you get itchy eyes and a runny nose and itchy um, or sore throat. Uh, but this is not the plant to blame. The plant to blame is actually ragweed, um, and it, which blooms at the same time as goldenrod, but um, because its flowers are so um, not showy and goldenrod is so showy and bright. Um, goldenrod gets blamed for hay fever. Um, but ragweed is wind pollinated, which means that its pollen granules are very lightweight. And so they spread on the wind very far, um, and get in people's eyes and noses and throats. Um, but goldenrod's pollen granules, um, in contrast are actually pretty heavy. They don't need to be light because goldenrod is pollinated by insects. Um, so they do not spread on the wind like ragweed pollen does. And so goldenrod is not the culprit for hay fever. Um, just something to note. And one of the reasons why I feel like, you know, goldenrod's kind of an underdog. You gotta defend it, but it's, it's a beautiful plant. Um, and I'm not even gonna try to identify this one because, um, would be very difficult, um, but suffice it to say, this is a goldenrod. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to my favorite plant of all time. This is jewelweed, um, and it's got these beautiful orange trumpet-shaped flowers, um, and they've got a nice spur back here where the nectar is, and as you might guess, something needs to have a pretty long mouth or tongue in order to get the nectar back there. So these are a favorite nectar food of hummingbirds, um, which can get back there with their long bills. Um, and this is my favorite plant for two reasons. Um, first, the crushed up um, leaves, which are beautiful bright green. They're very um, like thin and watery. When you crush those up, um, it makes an excellent um, herbal remedy for uh, anything that's itchy on your skin. So like poison ivy, nettle stings, bug bites. Um, you just kind of just rub the leaves right on your skin. And actually um, Wildflower Soap Works, which is a local uh, soap company based in Elk Rapids, makes an awesome jewelweed soap that works super well um, if you have poison ivy or any um, itchy, itchy skin um, issues. Um, and then the second reason that it's my favorite plant is because um, of its seed dispersal method. So I would show you, but the seeds aren't quite ready, but these are the seed pods right here. And um, when they're ready, when they're mature, they'll, they'll get fatter and look almost like green bean-like. Um, but jewelweed's other name is spotted touch-me-not. And touch-me-not because when the seed pods are mature, when you touch them, just a, just a little brush with your finger, they spring open and they shoot the seeds a couple feet away from the parent plant, um, which is like one of my favorite pastimes in September um, and in early October. All right, team, that's it for today. Thanks for joining me on this grassroot micro class. Um, and there are lots more late summer wetland wildflowers out there too that I didn't have time to show you today, but look for grass of Parnassus, which is kind of on its way out right now, but there are still some good specimens to be found out there. Um, great blue lobelia is gorgeous. Um, things like boneset and joe pieweed are on their way out, but you can still find them um, and lots of other beautiful blooms that are so important as late season nectar and pollen sources for things like bees, wasps, ants, um, flies, butterflies, hummingbirds. Um, yeah, so I will see you guys next week. Have a good one.